eats the pastor's heart and Dominic Steele. And in this first week of 2023, while Australia is mostly still on holidays, we're bringing you a best of episode. We're thinking about Australia's colonial history and a book out from John Harris, Judging the Macquarie's. Our guest is Peter Adam. Each year in the run-up to Australia Day, there's renewed debate about colonial history. John Harris has done us so many favours in this area. Most recently, his book, Scrutinising and Reassessing the lives of the early governor of New South Wales, Lachlan Macquarie, and his wife, Elizabeth. He paints a more spiritually positive picture of Governor Lachlan Macquarie than had previously been understood. Macquarie's wife, Elizabeth, was a clear evangelical. Lachlan Macquarie's Christian faith causes him to stand out in significant policy areas from the dominant views of his time. His attitudes and behaviour and policies relating to both convicts and Indigenous persons. As Harris paints it, the picture of Macquarie is in sharp contrast to his chief antagonist, the Reverend Samuel Marsden. The book caused me to reassess the more positive view of Marsden that I had propagated in 2015. The former principal of Ridley Theological College in Melbourne, Peter Adam, is one of the foremost voices in this space of Australian Christianity, and he is delighted with Harris's new work. And this is a replay of the interview we did with Peter Adam. I hope that you find it as stimulating as I did. Well, why don't you tell us about the heart of Lachlan Macquarie, Peter? Yes, well, I think one of the remarkable things about the book is is that it's written by John Harris, who's written so effectively uh, about uh, Indigenous people in Australia and Christianity and the churches. So his book, One Blood, I think, is is the really important Mm. book to read to understand that. Uh, And so he brings a particular perspective to the Macquaries, Lachlan Macquarie was uh, the fifth governor of New South Wales. He was uh, governor from 1810 to uh, 21. And uh, uh, I think that uh, he shows, uh, what Harris shows is that um, Macquarie's uh, heart was uh, one full of sympathy for people Uh, because of his Christian values. But Harris has also points out very helpfully that he was uh, sympathetic to people within the confines of his own uh, community and social understanding. So uh, he doesn't he doesn't do very well with indigenous people, to be honest, though he does better than some many other Australians at the time. So Mm. his aim for them is uh, civilization, by which he means uh, being settled in one place, uh, being educated, learning English, and getting what he regards as a proper job, mm. uh, which we now recognize as being a tremendously arrogant and insensitive way of treating Indigenous people. Yeah. But within the confines of his world and his understanding, he was trying to aid them and help them, uh, not to set them aside or despise them or reject them. So that's one of the most attractive things about him, I think, yeah. Let's go back a little bit um, and to his heart and, and his wife Elizabeth's heart. Um, she seems to be a genuine evangelical Christian from what I can make out from reading this book. Yes, I'm sure that's the case. Uh, I think that she was the more enthusiastic Christian, but I think Lachlan Macquarie had a kind of orthodox Christian faith. He believed in God the Creator and Christ the Saviour. He certainly wasn't exuberant about it in public. Uh, You know, he didn't give his testimony, but uh, he he did act out of Christian conviction, I think, and at great cost to himself. And it appears that he had a, a, a clear relationship with William Cowper, He was an attender of Cowper's Church, was there every week for the decade he was in the colony. Um, uh, And and (laughs) was present as a Christian man in church, yeah. Oh, absolutely, yes. I mean, that was partly his duty as as the governor, 
but I think uh, he, he would have gone to church wherever he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, he was influential with Elizabeth in starting the Bible Society in Australia. So mm. that shows a commitment. Uh, but in a way, I think his Christianity is expressed not so much in his words as in his actions. So one of the most moving things about the book is that he's the first governor uh, he, uh, with his wife, with his wife Elizabeth, to invite convicts to dine at Government House. That's a spectacular thing to do when you're there as the governor and uh, you've got the army under your control and the free settlers to keep happy. And he did that because he believed, he believed that transportation was the punishment. They had been punished and there was a possibility of redemption. He copped a lot of backlash for inviting convicts and ex-convicts and treating them as once their crime had been paid, he saw them as fully forgiven, which seemed a very gospel, a gospel minded attitude in contrast to some of the other um, attitudes around the colony at the time. Yes, that's right. Well, he thought, uh, I, hadn't, I, hadn't, I, hadn't, I hadn't realized till I read the book that uh, transportation was regarded as merciful because the other option was being, being hanged. So mm -hmm. uh, it was either death or transportation. Uh, and he thought that transportation was the punishment. And then if convicts were of you know, sound character and so on, and many of them were of sound character, uh, then they could be emancipated or set free and then regarded as equal citizens. And there's a line here where it says, I think his predecessor Bly released two prisoners uh, during his term as governor and Macquarie released 3,000 prisoners during his ter right. term as governor. That's right. yeah. Yeah. Which, which fits in with that, that sense of mercy. And, and justice as well, doesn't it? Because if they've paid their price to society, well, then you treat them as ordinary people, as we do, you know, people go to prison mm -hmm. for something. When they come out, they're, they're not regarded as second-class citizens. And yet he was strongly criticised for that by the chaplain, Samuel Marsden, and also, it, I think, the British authorities back in the UK. Yes, and, and by the free settlers like the MacArthur's. They didn't like it at, at all. Mm -hmm. uh, one reason for that is that uh, so many of the free settlers, and indeed uh, Marsden himself, depended on convict labour. And so once a convict was emancipated, then they weren't available to provide uh, <laughs> free, free work for the, for the settlers. Mm. But it was also a class thing. So uh, Samuel Marsden in particular had a very strong view of a, a, a class society. And because he was a magistrate and senior chaplain, he was part of the gentry and the convicts were lower down uh, the, the, the social scale, particularly if they were Irish and Catholic. Uh, and so they should be kept in their place. And in pushing back against that, Macquarie is, is extraordinarily ahead of his time. He is exactly right. That's quite right. Now, of course, the background also is the French Revolution. So uh, that the French Revolution made uh, some British people feel that we have to keep the class system in place, otherwise the whole, the whole thing will collapse. But Macquarie was very advanced, wasn't he, as you say, mm. uh, in thinking that if people have paid their debt to society, if we want to use that language, then they should be treated as respected citizens. Now, uh, I noticed uh, well, well, let's talk about the Indigenous people now and his treatment of Indigenous people, because he really was quite radical for his time. He, he set out to learn their language, all sorts of things. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and he tried, he did his best to protect them, though there was one, one regrettable occasion in which he ordered an attack on them, uh, which, uh, which was dreadful. But, in, in, but his general policy was uh, to civilize them, that is, according to European standards, uh, and to help them to integrate into the British, British society. But he did regard them as um, under the protection of the, uh, of the empire, of the British government, 
rather than savages who were not under the protection of the empire. Peter, um, I want to talk to you in a moment about that tragic in in incident that you alluded to a moment ago. But, um, but first, in terms of his overall attitude to the Indigenous, um, I'm just picking up on a quote from page 364. Unlike many in the colony and many who would follow him, Macquarie recognised that Aboriginal people had been dispossessed. That's an extraordinary statement from somebody as far back as the fifth governor of New South Wales. That's exactly right. That's quite right, yeah. And I think it's interesting because that view was around in England, though it, did, it wasn't the, ma the majority view, if I can put it that way. But it's encouraging to know that it was around in England at the time and that he held that view. I mean, it's perfectly obvious from our perspective, but as you say, it wasn't a common view at the time. It does go on to say, he goes on to say that um, there's, there's a point when the governor's role is to grant land, give land grants to people, and he gives land grants to some of the indigenous. And the quote that follows in this paragraph is, the irony never occurred to Macquarie that he was giving land to people from whom the colonialists had taken the land in the first place. Um, uh, but he did give the land. Yes, that, which was better than not giving land. Yes, that's right. Yeah. I'm going on. It does not excuse Macquarie that far more Aboriginal people would die under Governor Brisbane and his successor, but to ask Macquarie to be more than he was is to ask him to be the greatest and most enlightened person in the British Empire. The sin was the sin of the Empire far more than it was the sin of those who served it, perhaps blindly, but served it. Now, implied in that statement is um, Harris seems to be implying that Macquarie was the most enlightened person of the British Empire at the time on these issues. Is, is that how you came out of this book? Uh, well, when the, um, the, when the British uh, took over India, which was equally scandalous, um, they actually respected the Indians who loaned, owned land uh, they taxed them, but they respected kind of land possession. But they didn't do that in Australia because uh, Indigenous culture was, uh, was so far outside uh, their imagination of what could be the case. Now, now, now that's interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't reflected on that. But as you say that, I think Macquarie, I mean, one of the things you, I learned from reading this was Macquarie, um, uh, he spent a number of years in India before yes, he came to Australia. And so his worldview right. on how to treat the indigenous would have been partly shaped by his experience in India. Yes, that's exactly right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Tell us about this tragic incident at Campbelltown. Yes, uh, well, he's in a difficult position as a governor. He has to protect whoever, whoever is in danger. The indigenous people are justifiably trying to protect their land from invasion. Uh, and so uh, they do as best they can to protect their land. And of course, uh, Macquarie as governor has to then uh, punish them for attacking the white, the white people. Um, and as, as governor, he, he couldn't do anything else other than protect people. Um, uh, but again, you could say, well, he should have protected the indigenous people more effectively from the white settlers. But he was under the kind of government system of the day. And I think your point about uh, a sin of empire is very helpful because the, the sin of our community or our society is a sin which is very hard to recognise because it's instinctive to us. It's, uh, it's automatically just part of the air we breathe. And that's as true today as it was then. But we'd have to say that, uh, in Macquarie's defence, that he was on the more enlightened end of that spectrum than the view which regarded Indigenous people as uh, savages or animals. Mm. He certainly went out of his way to learn language, to communicate, uh, to have relationship. That's right. Yes, and the moving thing is when, when he's leaving, 
and he does a tour of the colony, how many indigenous people come to uh, to say a formal goodbye to him. So, mm. uh, they, they, their relationship with him was not soured. I think they instinctively saw that he respected them. Now, I think for me, I mean, the title of the book, Judging the Macquarie's, but you could almost equally say Judging Samuel Marsden in this book. And uh, it's a very harsh verdict on Samuel Marsden. Um, and in terms of my reading around, um, and I've, I've done much, much less in this than you've done, I know, but um, uh, I'd always been wanting to give Marsden the benefit of the doubt, but I find it difficult after reading this book. Do you, do you want to take, give us your take there? Yes, well, I re I reread uh, Yarwood's biography uh, on Samuel Marsden just to kind of get another viewpoint, um, but uh, I think it's uh, it's really sad that despite his you know ministry energy and despite his great reputation uh, in uh, for evangelising or beginning the evangelisation of New Zealand and his concern for evangelisation in the South Pacific. Uh, he didn't do so well in his home ministry. And I found this uh, really uh, haunting because it, uh, Harris makes it clear that he did engage, didn't engage in sexual sin. And our news at present is full of the sexual sin of pastors being their undoing. And it struck me that Marston is very, a very instructive example because he didn't engage in that kind of publicly scandalous behaviour, and yet his ministry was undermined by, uh, well, his, uh, the way he conducted himself. And extraordinarily, I think, that he had such a low view of uh, the possibility of redeeming uh, uh, um, convicts and Indigenous people in Australia. You'd think a, man, a gospel man would believe that no one was beyond the power of the gospel. It's, a, it's the, the power of salvation for all who believe. And yet he had this blind spot about Indigenous people in Australia and blind spot about convict. That, that's, that's an extraordinary situation to be in for a, 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 a man who claimed to be and was an evangelical, I think. Where do you... How, what do you make of Marsden's faith then? Well, I think there was a dislocation between his evangelical faith and his, uh, his involvement in and commitment to the class structure of British society. That is, his evangelical faith was, was uh, and conviction about salvation for all uh, was was blinded in a sense by an overcommitment to the class structures of his day, and so he's often writing about the deplorable behaviour of people in Parramatta, and you know how sinful they are, partly for the for the purpose of raising money from uh, England and continuing support from England. But you'd think he'd say, well. They are extremely sinful, but here is the hope of the gospel and we're, we're praying and working for their transformation. Mm. And we've seen some transformation in X, Y and Z as they have come to yeah. Christ. Yeah, we, That's exactly you'd right. You'd hope he'd, yes. he would be preaching that and, and saying that. That's right, yeah. But his, his, his condemnation of sin was about the lower classes' sins, not the, not his, not the middle class sins. Right. And I came out of the book thinking of him as, I don't know, Machiavellian, mischievous, uh, mischievous, um, uh, and deceptive, actually, in terms of how he represented Macquarie um, to the people back home. Yes, well, I think the, the, the heart of that was he had a highly inflated view of his own significance in the gospel economy of the South Pacific. He thought that he was the clue to, you know, that ministry, and you know, to, to be to, to be fair to him, that's how he'd been sent off by his evangelicals, by the evangelicals in England. You know, he was he was the man, the great bearer of the gospel, 
And so in order to promote himself and say how well he was doing, uh, he had to lie about what was actually being done. So he lied about his ministry to indigenous people, uh, which was non-existent. And he had to attack Macquarie in order to inflate his own importance. So one easy way to, to make yourself look important important is to attack other people and criticize them. And I'm afraid that's a very human foible, but it's one that evangelical ministers can fall into as well, and Marsden did. Mm. I th the paradigm shift that happened for me as I was reading this book was, I think I'd had the paradigm of the government, secularist, bad guys, and the preacher uh, enlightened, gospel-minded, good guy. And, um, and yet here we have the preacher acting with hypocrisy and not properly understanding the gospel and the governor acting in justice and mercy predominantly. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yes, he, he was more merciful than Marsden was. That's exactly right. Or to say the same thing another way, he had a greater, Macquarie had a greater belief in the transformation that God could achieve in people than Marsden did. Mm. Peter, your deep interest in Indigenous issues, how did it first come about? Well, I was doing some Bible studies at Katoomba, actually, on uh, the life of Elijah, and I was uh, speaking on Ahab and Jezebel trying to get Naboth's vineyard. And I thought to myself, now, what's a contemporary example of stealing ancestral land? And then I thought to myself, I'm standing in it. Right. <laughs> Australia is a notorious contemporary example of stealing ancestral land. So that's actually what, what got me uh, involved in the issue. Uh, that was many years ago now. And uh, uh, so I talk about it whenever I can. Um, and a number of Christians say to me, as I, I've talked uh, throughout Australia on the subject, a number of Christians say to me, look, I've never thought about this topic before. Well, some people say, look, we've already apologised. I say, well, we apologise for the stolen generation. We haven't apologised for the theft of land. Um, and I think that, that, that's, that, that sin still scars our country and our conscience. Yeah. And when you go to New Zealand and you appreciate the treaty that they have got, you, you realise, ah, there's something much, much better about the way that country has dealt with its indigenous people than the way this country has. Yes, it, it was not impeccable, I might say, but uh, at least they recognise there should be a treaty. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's right. Um, uh, the first time I noticed you speaking on this subject was 2009 when you gave a lecture um, and, and, and really said, we, the white Europeans, should offer to give it back, to, should offer yes. to vacate the country. That's um, right. Uh, how is the... I'm, I'm imagining lots of people have both debated and wanted you to qualify that since then. Um, how has your thinking changed since that lecture, or, or has it not changed? Well, uh, I was making an extravagant statement to try and help people recognise what had happened. Yes. Um, uh, but, uh, to be honest, if all the Indigenous people in Australia said, we think you should leave, you white fellows should leave, well, we should take that seriously. But I, had, I don't hear them saying that. Nobody said that to me. Yeah. But I'm just trying to say, I was just trying to get across the point that there, there was a sin and we haven't recognised it, let alone repented of it, let alone made any restoration. Hmm. Where was Macquarie different to the other people of his day? Well, uh, he didn't go around indiscriminately killing indigenous people. He recognised that they were human beings, not savages or animals. He believed that they had rights 
uh, in the community. Uh, his failure from, uh, from our later point of view is that he didn't recognize the form of their civilization or respect it, their way of life, and so wanted to Europeanize them. Uh, but I think within the limitation, severe limitations of his age, he wished them well rather than ill. Now, you might think, well, that's obvious, that's what you should do, but <laughs> many Australians didn't. Uh, either in that period in the 1800s or in the 1900s. Mm. So there were still indigenous people being shot in the early 20th century yeah. for sport. What's your message to us uh, this Reconciliation Week as somebody who has been deeply interested and involved in these issues for a long time? Listen. Pay attention and listen to Indigenous people. Uh, don't, don't tell them what to do or what we should do. Ask them. Listen to them respectfully, attentively and graciously. Peter Adam, thanks very much for talking to us this afternoon. A great pleasure. Thank you. Dominic. My guest on The Pastor's Heart, Peter Adam. He is the uh, former principal of Ridley Theological College uh, in Melbourne.